Today, we're going to talk about the proposed nine different types of intelligence and how you can improve each of them. My name is Matthew Jones. I studied the sciences in college and use that background to go on to direct programs teaching tons of kids, teens, and adults how to learn incredibly complex movements and do otherwise really cool things. Going through each of the different types of intelligence and how you can improve them, in the 1980s, a psychologist named Howard Gardner came up with a framework that proposed that intelligence can be broken into nine different types of categories. Categories, the first being logical mathematical intelligence. This is your ability to reason, calculate, and think logically. People with this intelligence excel in mathematical and scientific problem solving. To increase this type of intelligence, you can engage in puzzles, logic games, and brain teasers. Solving mathematical problems on a regular basis, learning programming or coding, or studying sciences like physics or chemistry to build analytical skills. The second type of intelligence is linguistic intelligence. And this is one most people probably thought I sucked at growing up because I had a lot of speech impediments. This is your sensitivity to spoken and written language. These individuals are good at reading, writing, storytelling, and memorizing words. To increase this type of intelligence, the best way is by learning a new language or even studying the structure of your own native language. Engaging in debates with people, practicing speeches, even writing your own creative stories and making your own daily journal. The third type is spatial intelligence. This is your ability to think in images and see things clearly. People with high spatial intelligence often excel in areas like design, architecture, and art. If you want to increase this, then you can practice drawing, painting, or using design software. Playing chess, puzzles, or video games also increases your spatial reasoning. So there's a thumbs up for most of us. The fourth type is something people would say I actually excel at, which is bodily kinesthetic intelligence. This is your ability to move your body well. To excel in athletics, be a dancer, even surgeons tend to have a high bodily kinesthetic intelligence. And of course, the best ways to increase this is by taking up a sport, dancing, or doing any sort of physical training. Or like me, doing tricks and gymnastic tumbling. Then we have the fifth one being musical intelligence. Musical intelligence is the ability to recognize, create, reproduce, and even just hear music in your head. Individuals with high musical intelligence often find it a lot easier to just pick up and play instruments, learn how to sing, or compose music. And of course, the best ways to increase this is by learning to play a musical instrument or sing, practicing listening to and analyzing different genres of music, creating your own music, or just practicing singing in the shower, with the six being your interpersonal intelligence. This is your ability to understand and interact effectively with others. People who are high in this are often skilled at communicating, empathizing with others, and socializing. And the best ways to get good at this is by practicing your active listening skills, having more meaningful conversations, practicing empathy by trying to understand others' feelings and their perspective, and just making a real effort to work well with others. With the seventh one being your intrapersonal intelligence. This is your capacity to understand your own emotions, your own motivations, your desires. People with good intrapersonal intelligence are often great at self-reflection, and self-regulation. The best ways to get good at this is by practicing mindfulness meditation, reflecting on your thoughts and feelings, and by studying philosophy. Then we have the eighth type of intelligence, being your naturalistic intelligence. This is the ability to recognize patterns in nature such as animals, plants, and otherwise be really good at gardening. It is thought that you increase this by spending more time outdoors, taking hikes, practicing gardening, or just observing wildlife. Then we have the ninth type of intelligence, being existential intelligence. This is otherwise how good you are at contemplating life's deep problems. Existence, the universe. People with high existential intelligence often seek answers to big questions. They are often better at studying philosophy, theology, or metaphysics. They enjoy having deep conversations about existence and their life's purpose, and enjoy spiritual practices. And now I'm just gonna stop the whole video right here, because this is where we get to the major problems with this. Gardner was one of the first to really challenge the idea of fixed intelligence, a very traditional idea that you were born with something that people called the G-factor or your general intelligence, that you were born one way and you were just stuck that way. And Gardner proposed something that was really nice, that people could be very smart in very different ways. But as Gardner proposed this, in the 1980s to the 1990s, something else profound came about. It was an idea that had been floating 
floating around for about the past 50 to 70 years, but it had never really gained any traction and didn't have that much substantial evidence behind it until it finally did. An idea that was called neuroplasticity. You see, in the 1980s and 1990s, some very robust research where researchers saw that people who had some severe injuries, their brains were actually able to relearn skills that if intelligence was fixed should have been lost but they weren't, as researchers and then thus the wider public realized just how malleable and changing our brains are from the moment we're born until the day that we die. Now, how do you actually increase your intelligence? Skills are everything. Anything you see anybody do is in fact a skill and it can be learned. The way to truly get your brain to learn faster is through this idea called neural reuse. Neural reuse in a nutshell means that whenever you learn to do something, it becomes much easier for your brain to learn how to do anything else remotely like it because your brain will leverage those existing pathways that it's already made in your head to do that new thing. And I think this is where people get in trouble and why this idea of a fixed mindset or talent comes about is that the very first time you go to learn anything new, whatever it is, you have no connections in your brain that are already made to do that. And anytime your brain has to make new connections to learn something that's completely new, this is a very very resource and effort intensive thing. It takes lots of very stressful focused training, in which case over the course of the next week or however much you're training, your brain will then create those new pathways and from that point on, it will now be much easier for your brain to do anything else that was like that. An example of this, I went to direct a program for a gymnastics gym. After about a month of being at this gym, I realized that most of the clients coming to it wanted to learn basic parkour and this was a problem because I didn't know basic parkour. So as I was teaching these classes, I started to teach myself how to do parkour. And I will tell you that I pretty much bulldozed my way well through most basic parkour movements and even got some intermediate movements. On the other hand, for students I was teaching, it took them weeks, maybe months to get those same moves that I knocked out in a couple days to maybe a few weeks. The way that you truly get smarter or faster at learning is to learn a ton of that thing and then anything else more about that thing like movement that you have to learn you will learn much faster than anybody else. Most teachers have what I call golden students. This is a student who shows up and can already do the thing you're teaching. They've already learned how to do the cartwheel. For a voice acting class I took they had already taken advanced voice acting classes had gigs as a voice actor and they could walk in and do a pretty good job on the mic voice acting. What these people people were doing in an intro to voice acting class, I don't know, but I would see teachers immediately favorite these students and they would say, yes, this student Johnny, he gets what I'm saying, he understands, he listens to me. And they would look at the other 9 out of 10 people in the class and would just think, all of us sucked, we weren't talented, we just weren't meant to do this, when really they were just bad at teaching and Johnny or the person who showed up to the class and was already able to do the thing, they were going to win with or without the teacher because they could already do the skill. Your brain is able to change itself through stress, through stimulus, to learn anything you want. And the way that you can get smarter, this is where a tool that has helped me out immensely comes in, which is to do high volume that our brain has to thrive off of stimulus, off of experience, and those experiences have to be successful experiences. So if you're going way too high above your skill level doing something, say a front flip, and you're just crashing repeatedly, none of those experiences count. You need to drop down to a lower step and then do high volume at that step to stimulate your brain as much as you can. I call this zone the Goldilocks zone, and it's basically the point to where what you're doing is novel, but it's not not so difficult that you can't successfully do it. The twist to all of this is that you can do a lot of volume for a very long time and still not be very good at doing something. And how can this be? This is because you're not focused on something called first principles, a place where I find a lot of teachers get into a lot of trouble. I define first principles as you breaking down whatever you're doing to the fundamental things that have to happen in order to make the thing you're doing work. Pointing your toes 
certainly makes a cartwheel look nice, but it's not what makes it work. Everything that you're trying to improve is something that actually pushes the ball forwards versus just making it look nice and sparkly. This is of course separate from genetic advantages that people have, which to anybody in the world of sports is in fact a very real thing. A thing that I go over in detail in this video right here. I hope this helped and I'll see you in the next one.